Hey folks, welcome back to this series on um, rapid paper reviews. And today we will quickly do a rapid overview of like three papers. Uh, this week has been quite busy. This week and last week, there have been an incredible number of interesting papers that came out. I haven't had a chance to read a lot of them, like the Titan paper, which is about test time um, learning. Um, and also the MinMax paper, which does like lightning attention and so on. But um, so I'll probably relegate to uh, relegate those papers for next week, but um, <clears throat> let's see what we have here. So the first paper uh, that we have is about um, LLM adaptation. Um, they call it transformer squares. Um, so the idea here is that an LLM would be able to adapt its weights uh, according to the task that it needs to do. So this is the you know like if we have to get to AGI, um, the um, language models need to be able to adapt, right? Like human, um, as, as we learn new things, as we experience more experiences, um, our, we accumulate knowledge, we grow our, our wiring and our brain changes uh, and so on. So um, the LLMs need to do that as well, right? Right now they're all static. So in this paper, this is where they uh, come up with this idea that depending on the different tasks, the structure of the LLM or rather the weights will change. Now, that sounds pretty good, but in reality, this is not how they do it. Um, so the idea is that um, for any task, they will have two passes. In the first pass, um, they, the LLM is just asked to generate, hey, what domain is this? Is this a simple q and Is this in movies? Is this, an, is this a math problem? And so on. Once the domain is identified, then um, we shift around the weights depending on what the domain is. So now, I mean, you could have done the same thing with LoRa. You could have done the same thing with like a billion different techniques. So the first pass is just like a router, which um, picks a domain and then you modify the weight. So I'm, I'm not um, completely like bought in into this idea. But um, so I, I just see this as a as a LoRa alternative. <clears throat> uh, instead of like regular fine tuning, they what they do is uh, they do reinforcement learning on the tasks, and and the idea is nice. So any weight matrix you can de decompose it. You can do do the singular um, matrix decomposition or singular value decomposition, where you have two matrices and then a, a matrix of just diagonals. Right. So. Um, now here, what they propose is um, the MLP layers. We will do the singular value decomposition, and then um, uh, the the diagonal. What we can do is we can train another vector, uh, which we will add onto the diagonal. I forget whether it's add or multiply. Um, yeah, so so basically, it's a multiplication. Um, so we'll just train train this diagonal vector. That is it for different tasks we will train the diagonal vector and then on test time we'll load this diagonal and then um and then so on um so you can also do like some fun things is uh given a task you can instead of just having one particular diagonal you can have like a mixture of diagonals at inference time so um training is very efficient because now instead of training a lot of parameters you're just tra training this diagonal worth of parameters. That's it, right? So, so this is very efficient that way, and uh, they 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 do RL because because you're cha training so less number of parameters, they get away with it, and and they, they say that this method of training, when you decompose things like this, and you only train the diagonal, is, is more stable. So that's why uh, they don't fall into the pitfalls of like RL, where you know, stability is a big deal. So, um, so so that's how they train like different task. Uh, specific modules now, you you can think of LoRa doing the same thing so I'm, I'm not sure like what's going on here um, but again like I haven't read it deeply but I'll, I'll leave that to you or uh, other YouTube creators um, right so um, and then um, yeah so how the model picks up um, um, one of the classes they, they try different things they they you know Sometimes you just use a prompt, um, you know, different things. They try uh, a bunch of different things. So, um, yeah, so that's, you know, it's it's a step in the direction of, like, adaptive LLMs. 
Um, it's not a large step. It's a very tiny step, but you know, something interesting. That's that's this paper. This was um, getting a lot of hype. I don't know why. Um, now the other paper, and I'm getting sick of all these names. Is uh, it's just a modification of attention instead of using like full matrix multiplications, rather a full instead of creating or uh, remembering a full matrix. Um, we will generate the matrix by doing uh, some kind of like tensor product. So let's uh, jump into it. So given an input, um, we will basically generate some small number of um, vectors. Well, you so the copies that you see here, one, two, three, are basically for the heads. And we basically generate a small representation. So, and so if you remember, the hidden dimensions are thousands of, um, like they're like 4,096 or like 2,000 something, that they're large, right? So instead of doing that, we will produce like some small representations. And um, the idea is um, that we will generate the entire Q matrix. So, so you need less number of parameters in this linear array to, to generate a smaller representation. And then we will generate the, um, the Q, K, and V by doing a tensor product between these two things. And then, you know, um, and then attention will go as usual. So um, that is pretty much um, the idea behind this. But let's look at the equations. It'll become a bit clearer when we look at the equations. Okay. Um, I mean, spoilers. Like this, the, what they say is um, compared to other attention methodologies, like you know, multi-head, um, grouped query, uh, multi-query, and so on, uh, they get better convergence. So it's more stable. I don't know about stable, but then like at least you can see the red loss is like uh, lower. So that's what. Um, okay. So. Let's first just quickly see um, your standard attention. You know, it's this. You have a query matrix, which is um, n times the internal dimension, where n is the number of tokens. Same for Q, uh, same for K, and uh, same for V. And attention becomes an n square matrix. In multi head, basically, you split this into heads. So you'll have a um, uh, head dimension. So the, a query for a given token is this. So um, so I refers to a head. So a query vector for a given token and for a given um, head is our DH. Now DH is different from DK, but DH times the number of heads is DK. Same for key, same for value. You perform attention at each head. So um, you, you combine all the queries from different our tokens and you you basically get um let's see yeah so r t times th where t i mean i don't know why they changed notation but then t is the number of tokens so attention would be this t square matrix um in multi-query attention you basically have um the query vector is as is but for key and value you only have like one of them so um um right so so and so, so here what happened is like you had um for each token you had a um for for each token you were generating um a separate query key and value head um but here what you do is for um you will kind of um sorry for not for each token for each head, you were generating different keys and values, but in the multi-query attention setting, for each for each head, you will generate a separate query, but you will only generate one key and value for across all heads. That's that's the difference. So, um, multi-head attention, you have for each head you have Q QKV, but in multi-query attention for each head, you have just Q, and the the K and V are the same. Uh, in grouped query attention, so so multi query attention is one one end of the spectrum. Um, um, multi head attention is the other end of the spectrum. In grouped query, you have like groups of v's. So you take a few heads, and for them you share you have a shared vector v. You for for a uh, and then shared vector k. 
Uh, query is always for every head you have a separate query. It's just a way of like you know cutting down on the memory requirements and so on. Um, and then you have uh, latent attention, which was introduced in the DeepSeq version of papers, in which you generate an internal representation instead of like just acting on the um, the hidden dimension. You generate an internal representation, and then you generate the uh, uh, keys and values from the internal representation and same for query uh, it was done because like so this way you get so this internal representation or this latent representation is like low rank so you uh your kv usage is low uh, so you get like inference time advantages and so on um yeah so in tensor product retention basically for each token um you generate so let's see um Right, so again, the notation is a bit different from what I'm used to, so that's why like I'm fumbling a bit. But um, right, so capital T is the number of tokens, which is okay. Um, and we know the internal dimension of the model is equal to the number of heads and the hidden dimension of the models, uh, hidden dimension of the heads. So a regular query key vector as the dimension, num um, uh, the you know, number of tokens, and then number of heads, and then internal dimension, because it's tokens times T model, right? So nothing, nothing fancy. Now, for each token, uh, the dimension is number of heads times hidden dimension of the head. So the way you generate this is by using this um, tensor product so each of them is a uh, representation in rh and rdh so the tensor product will be rh times rdh so here uh, so tensor product between these two becomes rh plus rdh and then you sum over uh, you know some numbers of them and that's how you generate the qt matrix the kt matrix and bt so essentially now instead of storing um the matrix worth of values now you store two vectors worth of values and again you can do all sorts of things and like generate latent representations and so on um, the rest of the process works as before like uh, attention is query times k transpose and so on and so forth um, this plays ball with rope so if you just like apply you can apply rope in this internal like in this small dimension and then uh, when you do the tensor product, uh, it, you know, the rope plays ball and everything works as proper. Like, you know, all the properties of rope are unperturbed. So that's good. And then, you know, there are all different representations of it. Now, just to show you the difference, um, the multi-headed engine was order D square in terms of number of parameters. Uh, this one, uh, just like the vanilla one is just order D times some, some constant um right okay i think um well you know it's order d but dh is also um you know <laughs> d model divided by something so um yeah i don't know like depending on these numbers we'll see like how these factors play out but um the kv cache values are also limited so you know we'll see and there are like different variants of it. Um, and they finally, they show that. Uh, so that's the only difference. Like rest of the networks remains the same. And they train it on a small model uh, and on the fine web, like 100 till 100 billion tokens. Uh, so they have like, you know, half a billion parameter model. And, um, you know, they show good results. So, yeah, so that's, that's, you know, I think that's how much, that's the most you can compress this, um, this kv cache and attention mechanism because tensor product is like the other end of the spectrum uh, compared to like dense products um yeah so time will tell whether this methods but whether this method uh, has some value or not but in interesting nonetheless finally um, oh no my beer is over okay so finally um deep seek r1 so in the previous video we talked about uh, the DeepSeq v3 paper um, r1 is a reasoning model and it's interesting because in r1 what they do is 
they skip. So the standard process of any reasoning model, at least though the ones that um, you know we, we've seen, is you have a pre-training phase that that creates the language model. Then you have an instruction tuning or supervised fine tuning phase where you do a lot of bunch of like fine tuning. And then there is this reinforcement learning phase. So in this in this paper, they just get rid of the second phase and they say, you know what, just do reinforcement learning and all will be good. And so um, they have so they have like twofold results. So the first thing is that they take um, um, they take deep seek v3 base. So you know the, the pre-trained model, and then they do reinforcement learning and they produce deep seek r10 which does pretty good, but then they ha it has some issues of like, you know, um, generating some garbage text or like unintelligible text. So instead of that, what they do is they, they, they take DeepSeq v3, do a bit of SFT and then do reinforcement learning and they get good results. Now, after they have this good result, DeepSeq R1 model, what they do is they distill smaller models with this data and those uh, the reasoning capabilities of the smaller models becomes good. That is pretty much it. Uh, they do reinforcement using GRPO, which was again introduced by I think um, the Deep Seek guys again. Um, I don't know the details of Deep Seek, but it's like pretty close to PPO. Um, but you know, so this is, looks very similar to PPO loss. Um, but you know, I they don't quote me. Um, so in, for for the reward modeling part, they they don't have a model; they just have like a rule based reward. And um, that is pretty much it about this paper. Like that's that's the key thing. Like they they, they get rid of the fine tuning step and they just do um, reinforcement learning. Now now the, the the thing is maybe their base model was so good that um, maybe the base model already had some fine fine tuning data. Uh, fine tuning data. So um, so I don't know. I'm not a and the fact that they have to do like cold start um, to get a better model. They have to do a bit of fine tuning. So I'm I'm not completely sure. But you know something like. We're seeing a trend now towards reasoning models. Um, yeah. Well, I guess this is it for this week. Um, thanks for, if you watched the whole of it, thanks for being here. And, uh, you know, like and subscribe. All right, cheers. See you next time.